The zombie apocalypse might not be looming in the real world anytime soon, unless you're an ant, crab, or fish, in which case it may have kind of already started. On HBO's The Last of Us, humans are typically infected with a variant of the cordyceps fungus in classic zombie fashion. Some characters speculate that the pandemic began when spores infested the food supply. Surprisingly enough, that's pretty close to a real-world phenomenon. When an unfortunate ant comes into contact with Ophiocordyceps spores, they latch onto the ant's hard exoskeleton and make their way through the rest of its body. The process then proceeds agonizingly slowly, as infected ants can linger on for weeks as the fungus takes root. This gives the fungus plenty of space to fully establish itself within the ant's tissues and begins to manipulate its behavior. Once the Ophiocordyceps really has its hold on an ant, it begins to take over its muscle tissue. To get technical, it grows fungal bodies around those muscles and releases chemicals that facilitate this control through muscle contractions. To get untechnical, this makes some zombies, allowing the fungus to direct the ant's behavior, including walking, climbing, and clamping mandibles down on a leaf. This also affects how the ant is able to use its antennae, as some infected species have been observed with their antennae stuck in an L shape. This makes it difficult for the ant to communicate with members of its colony and move through its environment, thereby driving it away from its home base. Ants aren't the only creatures that have to be scared about losing control to parasites. For example, the California killifish has a formidable opponent in the form of a seemingly easy to defeat flatworm. Euimplorchus californianus can infest killifish by leaving them with thousands of cysts in and around their brains. This changes the fish's behavior very much for the worse. A 1996 paper published in Ecology found that infected killifish begin swimming in a way that makes them between 10 to 30 times more likely to be consumed by predatory birds, killing the fish in an ironic name twist. And that's all part of the flatworm's plan, as it then goes through the bird's digestive tract and continues on with its reproductive cycle. The fish do try to fight back, though. A 2020 paper in Functional Ecology demonstrated that killifish that had been exposed to the presence of the parasite demonstrated increased metabolic activity, whether or not they were actually infested. For many animals, a fungal infection is pretty bad news. But in at least one case, it might actually make them do their best Professor Farnsworth impression. Good news, everyone! Botrachocytrium dendrobotitis is a fungus that appears to help male frogs produce louder, longer calls in an effort to link up with female frogs. According to research published in the journal Biology Letters in 2016, that's exactly what happened to a group of Japanese tree frogs in the wild. Precisely why this happens isn't entirely clear, though it could be a way for the fungus to increase transmission, considering how successful males are more likely to make physical contact. But this is far from a perfect system. The fungus can lead to a condition known as chytridium mycosis, which affects hundreds of different amphibian species around the world. They may stop eating, have convulsions, and begin shedding copious amounts of skin. Some species have been so hard hit that their populations are perilously low or even extinct. Some frogs have developed a defense in the form of antifungal bacteria growing on the skin, but decreased temperatures can lower those defenses and allow the fungus to proliferate. Some fungi really have it out for the animal kingdom, including Massospora cicadina. As you can probably tell by its name, or maybe you can't because my Greek is so terrible. Sorry about all these pronunciations, clearly I didn't have a classic education. Anyway, it targets cicadas. It's a bit cruel when you consider that cicada broods spend well over a decade doing their thing underground before emerging to speed run through their reproductive cycle and then die. But Massospora cicadina is also waiting quietly in the soil right alongside its pending hosts. If a cicada comes into contact with the fungal spores in the soil, things seem fine at first. But once the cicada morphs into its adult phase, it's a different story. For males, part of their abdominal exoskeleton falls off, revealing the fungus that's been growing underneath the whole time. Despite the devastating damage, the fungus has a trick up its sleeve. According to research published in Fungal Ecology in 2019, different massospora species can dose the bugs with an amphetamine known as cathinone or psilocybin mind-altering compound in magic mushrooms. The juiced-up cicadas are less hungry, more energetic, and rather frisky. They become hypersexual, and they just want to mate with any cicada they can find. In their fruitless attempts to mate, the cicadas dust fellow insects with spores and encourage the spread of the fungus. Wasps and their stingers are already terrifying enough on their own, but at least be grateful that you're not a cockroach. That's because the emerald jewel wasp uses a special venom to turn its cockroach victims into willing hosts for its hungry young. It starts when a tiny female wasp stings a cockroach's mid-body with a paralyzing venom. She then stings it again with the venom cocktail straight into the roach's brain. 
Once a paralytic wears off, the cockroach begins grooming itself, which may just be a side effect, or could provide a relatively clean host for the eggs. Meanwhile, the wasp prepares a cozy little burrow in which she leads the roach with an egg stuck to its leg. But that's not before she breaks off its antennae and drinks a bit of roach blood as a quick pick-me-up. That egg will hatch in a little less than a week, and the newly emerged larval wasp crawls into the cockroach and begins eating it. It specifically targets its trachea to provide air, and then it takes about 48 hours for the roach to finally die. Toxoplasma gondii, that's another parasite making a name for itself. This single-celled protozoan really punches above its weight. It needs to get into a cat's digestive system to continue its reproductive cycle, but first it has to take a detour through a rodent. According to a 2011 paper in the journal Plus One, when rats are exposed to the smell of cat urine, toxoplasma increases their brain pathways to push them to reproduce. Then when an actual cat appears and presumably eats the rodent, the parasite can get into the feline's digestive system and continue making new parasite protozoa. Another Plus One paper from 2013 found a very similar effect in mice that seemed to be permanent even after the parasite was removed. And it's not just rodents that are affected by toxoplasma. A 2016 paper in Current Biology noted that infected captive chimpanzees appeared to show less fear around the droppings of leopards, a natural predator of theirs. And toxoplasma can even infect humans, but it's not turning us into an army of the undead, it just causes flu-like symptoms. Some animals might actually benefit from toxoplasma infestation, like the wolves in Yellowstone National Park. To understand what toxoplasma is doing with these wild canines, you first need to know that wolf packs are generally a family group led by a female male pair. Occasionally, an adult wolf will break away from this group to start a pack of its own, although operating as a lone wolf can be a dangerous proposition. Or maybe some of these canines like to live dangerously. But according to a 2022 study published in Communications Biology, when toxoplasma gets into a lone wolf system, it's 11 times more likely to strike out on its own. What's more, wolves that carried the parasite were a staggering 46 times more likely to become pack leaders. As for how they're picking up the parasite in the first place, researchers believe it has something to do with the territory crossover between wolves and cougars. It's not just fungi and protozoans turning animals into zombies, as some species of barnacles are also getting in on the fun. Saculina barnacles latch onto the crabs while they're in their larval stage, and then start growing a root-like structure that infiltrates the crab's body. Over time, the parasite takes over so much of the crab that it begins to form large growths at the bottom of its body. At this point, the barnacle is able to trick the crab into taking care of the parasite as if it were its own pouch of eggs. That means attentively cleaning it and making sure it's washed over with plenty of oxygen-rich water to help it grow, even though the growth has destroyed the crab's ability to make its own offspring. When it's time for the larvae to emerge, the crab will climb to a conveniently high spot and even help to agitate the water to more fully disperse the parasite to begin its life cycle anew. So if you've seen The Last of Us, you're rightfully worried about a real-life cordyceps apocalypse, but is human infection actually possible? According to scientists, not at all. Like many other parasites, ophiocordyceps are tailor-made for carpenter ants. In fact, fossils hint that they've been doing their thing as far back as 48 million years ago. Plus, considering major biological differences between ants and humans, a jump to our species is highly unlikely. For one thing, humans don't have exoskeletons. What's more, it's really difficult to spread fungi person to person. So unless someone is literally sneezing out mushrooms, you should be fine. 